Good morning, Grace, and welcome you guys here. If you're new, my name is Clay, one of the pastors, along with Mark, and soon to be Jared. As you saw on April 2nd, he will be ordained as our third pastor, so that's pretty exciting. And every time we gather, one of the things we love to do is preach and teach through books of the Bible, and we do this because we really do believe the Bible is God's Word given to us, not just for rules of life or ways to live, but because it points us to the creator of all life, the one who designed and made everything that we get to live in, God. Who Then we find out in this book that he took on flesh. He lived the perfect life we should have lived. He died the death we should have died. But then he also rose and defeated death, conquered it for us so that we could be brought into his kingdom by belief in him, trusting in him and his finished work on our behalf. And now we get to reap all the benefits of his hard work. So, so I would read the Bible, not just to know what to do, but to see who's done it for us. But then in response, once we see what he has done, to find out what identity is in him, now we see, okay, now what does our life look like in response? So if you want to grab your Bible, whether that is in book or app form, you can turn with me to the Gospel of Luke. It's going to be in near the end of your Bible. If you want to use a paper Bible, don't feel bad about using the table of contents. If you want to use your app, that's totally fine too. You can use a search function if you're looking for it. If you'd like a paper Bible, we have a few at the back by the giving box that you can just take home as our gift to you if you don't have one. We want you to be able to read God's Word, enjoy it, and continue to get to know Him better. So I'm going to read, or I'm not going to read, but we're going to listen to God's Word being read. But before we do that, uh, while you're turning there, let's just pray to hear uh, from God's Word. Father, I thank you that we have your Word. That we can trust what you've said, what you've written through your apostles, prophets, and teachers. And I pray that we continue to learn about who you are, what you've done. Bring us closer to you. Open our eyes to see what you want us to see. Open our ears to hear what you want us to hear. And give us a greater understanding and clarity of your love for us. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, let's listen as the scriptures right on the screen behind me. Reading from Luke, chapter 2, verses 41 to 52. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, They went up according to the custom. And when the feast was ended, as they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents did not know it, but supposing him to be in the group, they went a day's journey. But then they began to search for him among their relatives and acquaintances. And when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem searching for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. And when his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. And he said to them, Why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? and they did not understand the saying that he spoke to them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. And his mother treasured up all these things in her heart, and Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and men. So I think there's probably a lot of us who are maybe just more than a little curious And for the curious among us, we probably wonder, what would Jesus have been like as a kid? What would his childhood have been like? And maybe you wonder, you know, what would it have been like for Joseph and Mary to raise the perfect son? What what did his brothers think of him and his sisters? Like, how did this all work? What was this time of his life like? But as curious as we might be, there's not actually a lot of information given. In fact, what we have here today is the only kind of glimpse we get between when, ba- when Jesus was a baby and when he's about 30 years old, just before he gets baptized. So there's not much information we had. And that's likely because for this time and place, Jesus would have just lived a very ordinary life. And for his first 30 years of life, it's likely that it was just relatively boring, normal, unexciting. But what we get to remember is that even in that, it was for our sake. What Jesus did in these boring years of his life, it was for us. See, Jesus knows what it's like to live every aspect of life, even the boring, mundane, normal, routine things of life. 
And when he did that, he did that in complete worship to God the Father. Every minute of every day, of every week, of every, like he did it all the time, completely worshiping God the Father in everything. And I think there's actually something quite remarkable in that. If you think about your life, maybe you think, well, it's, it's actually the, the normal times in my life that I forget about God or have a hard time keeping on track with what he's done. But when you go through a crisis, when something exciting happens, then you're more awakened to your, either your need for God or that God came through in that need. But it's in the normal everyday stuff of life that it actually sometimes seems to be difficult. But I love how it says in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. So when we're tempted to feel sorry for ourselves because we see how much others, maybe half our age, are already accomplishing, or maybe we start to resent the lot we have in life, we can remember that Jesus knows what it's like to live a normal life. He knows what it's like to deal with the brokenness of this fallen world, to sympathize with us because he lived it too. And part of that normality of life, we actually get to see right away in verses 41 and 42. It says this, Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the Feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up according to the custom. So as responsible Jewish parents, Joseph and Mary, they made it a regular practice to go to Jerusalem every year for that Feast of Passover. Now, interestingly enough, it was only a requirement for the the men aged 21 and older to go. That means their wives didn't have to come, the families didn't have to, they were welcome to, but it wasn't a requirement. But the cool thing we get to see here is that Mary chooses to go. We see Jesus is along too. This means they made it a family thing. Joseph and Mary, they, they weren't just doing the bare minimum. They sought to devote themselves to worship God together as a family. I think this is awesome because we see that this is done out of joy. They're excited to do this. And then even thinking again back to the last verse we went through last week, verse 40, it said, And the child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. So this regular occurrence of Mary and Joseph bringing Jesus together with God's people, this was one of the ways that Jesus grew in his faith. This is one of the ways he was able to learn. He was able to see Joseph and Mary devote themselves to the regular faithful gathering of God's people to celebrate what God has done, to celebrate his promises and his redemption. And so in the same way, for those of us who are parents, if we want our kids to grow, it's going to take some effort on our part, isn't it? It means we're going to have to make a regular practice of gathering with God's people, where we actually make it a priority, and it's not just this once-in-a-while kind of thing. Now, if you don't know anything about the Passover feast, it was this celebration of the first Passover I know if you've been around for a while, we talk about it often when we talk about communion. But this is where God's people had been rescued out of slavery in Egypt. See, what happened was God had called a man named Moses, and he was to lead the Israelites out of Egypt into the promised land. But they were slaves, and there was the leader, Pharaoh, who was essentially holding them hostage, saying, you can't go. That is, until God sends a series of plagues to convince him who's really in charge. Because even when we have human leaders who seem like they have a stranglehold on us, we understand from Scripture that God is ultimately in control. They can only ever do what God allows them to do. So in order to demonstrate his power, God sends this final plague to reach Egypt. And the plague is to kill the firstborn in every home unless that household put their faith and their trust in God for their deliverance. Now, you might wonder, well, how how were they supposed to do that? Was there a sign? Were they just supposed to pray? Well, we actually get to see that in order to demonstrate that they believed God, they were to kill a lamb and place the blood of the lamb on the doorposts of their houses. So this would be a sign that the lamb had given its life for the sake of that household in place and substitution for that firstborn child. And so when God saw the blood of the lamb... On the doorposts, he would pass over or cover. That's what the word Passover literally means. So he would cover that house to prevent the angel of death 
from striking down the firstborn in that home. So God's the one who's covering. And, and there's, a, there's a really cool thing about this when, when you think about it, because where they were to put the blood on those doorposts, if you were to stretch out your arms, the blood would go here in this hand, here in this hand, and one like right around the head. I think there's a picture in there somehow. So then they would also eat the lamb, and they would bake the unleavened bread in preparation for their trip out of Egypt and into the promised land. And so this would be something that God told them, you guys should celebrate this. So they did year after year for generations in remembrance of God fulfilling his promises in rescuing them from slavery and death and bringing them into this amazing land where God is in complete control. And they would feast for eight days every year in celebration and recognition of this redeeming God. And so now we have Joseph and we have Mary once again going to the feast. This time, Jesus is 12 years old. Now, for many of us, we probably don't come from a Jewish background, so we maybe don't see the significance of Jesus being 12 here, especially in our culture where we treat 12-year-olds like they're just little kids who can't do anything. But this would have actually meant that this was the final year that Jesus was going up to the Passover feast before his bar mitzvah. Again, if we're not Jewish, you might not have a clue of what that means. The word literally means son of the covenant or son of the law. So that means they were entering into a special time where they were responsible to be under the covenant on their own accords, their own merits. So you see, when a boy turned 13, he was now declared to be a man. Some of us might laugh at that, but that's how it was. Maybe we could do well to actually think of these young 13-year-old boys as men. But that meant they were now responsible for their own spiritual journey, responsible to learn their own craft, prepare their mind, body, and soul for a life of worship and devotion in every area of life. So this was the last time in that culture for Jesus to now have his father explicitly teach and explain and pour into him during these celebrations of Passover before Jesus was to take that responsibility upon himself. Now, that's not to say that fathers are just, okay, well, you're 13, it's all up to you now, you're out of the house, do your own thing. Like, that's not the case either. It's not that they no longer bear any responsibility at the age of 13. And, and I'm sure there would have been many continued discussions and, and chats that Joseph and Jesus would have had in the years to come. But the cool thing is that there's actually a difference in how these conversations take place. If you have older sons, maybe some of you have started to see that, where it becomes less about just, now I'm talking to a child, but if they are a believer in Jesus, you start to relate to them more as brothers in Christ. If you have older kids, do you, you get to relate to them as brothers and sisters in Christ rather than just as children. There's something amazing in that. And this is how Joseph would have been relating to Jesus after this bar mitzvah. But then the feast is over and it's time to go home. So what happens? Let's read verse 34, or 43 to 45. And when the feast was ended and they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents did not know it, but supposing him to be in the group, they went a day's journey. But then they began to search for him among their relatives and acquaintances. And when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem searching for him. Now some of you might be thinking, didn't you just say that Joseph and Mary were responsible parents? Well, they're so responsible. how they lose Jesus? I mean, who loses the Son of God? I mean, thankfully, there's a cultural clue in here for us. It says that they began to search for him among the relatives and acquaintances. See, in those days, you probably know this, but they didn't have SUVs and minivans that just let you drive a few hours to get wherever you needed to go, but they actually had to walk sometimes for days to get where they wanted to go. And when you're walking that far, the truth is it's, it's a lot safer to travel in groups. And so most families would travel together with the entirety of their hometown. So they would go from their hometown to go and celebrate the Passover and be this large caravan that went together. It's not a Dodge caravan, but it's a group of people that go along together to travel. And usually the women and the young children would be up in the front and then the men and the older boys would be at the back. 
So now Jesus is 12. He's like maybe on that threshold. So you could think there's maybe some assumptions being made. I'm not going to say it was Joseph who thought wrong. Could have been Mary who thought wrong. But have you ever had this with your spouse if you're married? Guys, you've probably had this where you assume something of your wife. She assumes something different. And all of a sudden, where are the kids? Well, I thought you were hanging out. I thought you were what? And this is what's happening to Mary and Joseph. They assume that they're somewhere where they're not. And so Jesus is missing. But we also have to remember that Jesus is the perfect child, right? And so there's, they've never had a reason to not trust Jesus before. I mean, it, it's never the obedient kids who you're always on the lookout for, right? Because you know, well, they're kind of come in when it's time. If, if we tell them they're gonna be, supposed to be home by five, they'll be home by five. It's, it's the other kids, right? <laughs> it's the troublemakers you're constantly on the lookout for. You're keeping a sharp eye on them. But the ones who are obedient, you don't really have to. I mean, you should also check in on your obedient kids because sometimes if they're like I was, you look obedient, but you're actually not obedient on the inside. But that's for another time. But what likely happened then was they traveled with the caravan and they finally stopped for night. And they're looking around trying to set up the tent. Like, where's Jesus? He's usually helping set the tent up and he's not there. So they realize, oh, Something's happened, so now they have to make another day's journey back to Jerusalem, and that's when they find out he wasn't there. So let's read verses 46 to 47 to see what happens when they get back to Jerusalem. After three days, they found him in, in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. Notice how it says, after three days. And we'll come back to that, but I, I really just want that lingering in the back of your mind, there's three days. So where do they first see him? He's in the temple, amongst the teachers. And I love how it describes Jesus' dis disposition here, because what's he doing? It says he's listening to them, and he's asking questions. So this is where we once again get to see it played out, that Jesus had to learn, just like us. It's crazy because even though Jesus was in complete control of everything, right? He's the creator of the universe. He's the sustainer of the universe. He's holding everything together. At the same time, he has to learn. And he has to grow. Now, you might be wondering, how does that work? I, if you're like me, you've probably just tried to wrestle through that and you go, my brain can't handle that. I don't understand how that works. And, and you think, well, I thought God was all-knowing. So is, is Jesus not all-knowing? Well, the answer is yes, Jesus is all-knowing. God is all-knowing, and Jesus being God, he is all-knowing as well. But in his humanity, Jesus didn't give himself access to all that he knew in his divinity. You see, Jesus, unlike us, he has two natures. We have one nature, a human nature, a flawed and sinful human nature at that. But Jesus has two natures. See, when he took on humanity, he didn't cease being God. He didn't give up his divinity. But instead, he added a human nature to his divine nature. So that means he's not half God and half man. He's also not just mostly God and partially man or mostly man and partially God. He's fully God and fully man together as one. And in his humanity, though, we have to remember that he felt things just like we do. Exhaustion, sadness, hunger, thirst, all, all those things. And he also got to experience feeling what it's like to learn and needing to learn, not knowing everything. But he did this all at the same time while he maintained his full God nature, where he is all-knowing, all-present, all-powerful, and never-ending. If you can wrap your mind around that, then you're, you're better, than me, better than me. But it's cool because when we actually read through the Gospels, there are times when we see him act in accordance with his divine authority and his divine knowledge. Like when it says he knew people's thoughts or when he sees Philip under the tree, when he calms the storm, when he knows the history of the woman at the well. We see these examples where, no, he, he's definitely God, 
But as it says in Philippians chapter 2, this is what it says in verses 5 to 7. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. So in his humanity, he emptied himself of his power and ability in order to identify with us fully, not just partially. And so when he was leaning into his godness, it was for the express purpose of demonstrating that he truly was and is the very God of the universe come to dwell amongst his people. You see, we start to get into trouble when we overemphasize one of his natures to the neglect of the other. And so some cults and false teachers, they'll overemphasize his divinity to the neglect of his humanity. So then, for example, you have people say, well, it wasn't really a big deal for him to die on the cross because he's God. So of course he could endure that. There's an issue there, isn't there? Or on the other end, you have people who overemphasize his humanity. And they'll say things like, well, if, if Jesus did it, that means we now have the power to do it. So anything we want to do, we, just, we can declare reality to be whatever we want, and it'll happen. Because Jesus did all these things, so if he was fully man, then that, of course, means we can do that too. So because of these potential errors and actual errors, in, in the year 451, there was a council of church leaders who got together to look at the to look at the scriptures and to discuss and discern how to defend what we actually know to be true based on what the Bible says against these false teachings that were trying to explain away one of Jesus' dual natures. And it was called the Council of Chalcedon. And I just, I love how R.C. Sproul summarizes it, so I'll read that. He says, In the Incarnation, the Son did not surrender any of his attributes. The divine nature is still eternal, infinite, omniscient, omnipresent, and omnipotent. So that means never-ending, all-knowing, all-present, and all-powerful. And, and he goes on to say, The divine nature manifests all the attributes that belong to deity. God did not stop being God when he took on a human nature in Jesus. At the same time, the human nature retained its own attributes, being finite, contained, unable to be at more than one place at the same time, limited in knowledge and limited in power. All of those attributes of humanity remained attributes of Jesus' humanity. So again, if you're having a hard time wrapping your mind around that, that's okay. It's probably as easy to understand as the Trinity. And if you can completely comprehend that, again, I don't know how you do it. it from a logical standpoint, you go, okay, this is far and beyond what I can comprehend. But in the Trinity, we actually have three persons sharing one nature. And then we have Jesus, who is one person sharing two natures. Maybe your mind's not blown. Mine is consistently blown when I think about this. But you don't actually necessarily have to fully understand this. But it's really good to have this in the back of your mind when you're reading through the Bible to really try to understand what this is saying about who this guy is. But if we go back to Luke here, I love how in verse 46, we actually get to see a little bit more of Jesus' humility, his character. See, one of the things of Jesus is he's the most humble man who ever walked the earth. Completely humble. Not even just mostly humble. Completely humble. And we see that Jesus is someone who loves to listen. And he's not afraid to ask questions. And what we need to know is that Jesus is actually still like this. He still loves to listen. So that means when we pray, we can remember this. Jesus loves to listen. This, I hope, should give you reason to pray and power to, to pray because he loves to hear us. Even though he knows everything, he delights in us conversing with him. It's a joy for him to hear us. He doesn't just put up with our prayers. He actually enjoys it. He loves to listen. And the beauty is that now, when he's not fully embracing his humanity, where he is, again, completely in control, while still he is still a man too, we have to keep that in mind, but anytime we pray to him, we're not telling him anything he doesn't know. But that doesn't stop him from wanting to hear us because our God's a listening God. So I hope this actually gives you a greater freedom to pray those things that you might even be scared to pray. 
precisely because God already knows. So that means if there's sin you need to repent of, if there's temptations you might be ashamed of, if there are people in your life who you want to be saved, you can pray with confidence knowing that he loves to hear you and he loves to listen. And at the same time, we, we see here that he, he's not afraid to ask questions. So when we pray and when we read our Bible, you might even get a glimpse of him asking you questions. How he's questioning you and challenging you, getting you to think through things differently through what you read in his word. And then verse 47, we see that with all the listening and the questions he asks, all who heard him, they're amazed. There's this 12-year-old kid with such wisdom and knowledge, it's just like, who is this guy? I don't know if you can picture this in your head, but it's like he's, he's conversing with PhDs. I don't know many 12-year-olds who would be able to have that kind of conversation where you go, okay, not only is he grasping this, but he's asking us questions that are making us think. Like, that's amazing. And in this, we also have to remember the way he's talking with them, the way he's asking the questions, the way he's conversing, it's not just because he's God himself. I mean, obviously that's part of it, but he, again, he's not leaning into his divinity here because he still had to learn. He still had to study. He still had to grow. But just imagine for a second, what would your learning, what were you studying, what would your Bible reading be like if you didn't have sin weighing you down? He doesn't have to worry about all the different ways we love to use our our little lawyer inside our heads to make us think, eh, that doesn't apply to me. I don't have to worry about that. But when you can actually read the Bible and interpret it properly because sin is not getting in the way, I mean, that's something I want. But the the beauty is that there's a day coming when that will be true of us, where we will be able to read the Bible and be perfectly in tune with what God's trying to tell us. and We don't have any of the sin wrecking that for us. I'm looking forward to that day, and that day is going to come when Jesus returns, makes all things right and all things new. We will know as we are fully known. Oh, it's going to be awesome. But then in verse 48, we actually get to see Mary's response when they finally find him. And when his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. So first, Again, they're astonished. They're watching this happen. They're like, Jesus is talking to those PhDs? And it's like he understands everything they're saying. I mean, can you just imagine Joseph? They're going like, I'm only getting like 50%. Of what, and Jesus is like asking them these deep questions. But then the astonishment just seems to go straight to what looks like a swift rebuke from Mary. And if you're a parent, you can, you can probably identify with this, right? I mean, I know that there's been times when we're chatting and we're all of a sudden like, hey, we're missing like three kids. Where are they? And, and fear gets to set in after like 30 seconds. So can you imagine three days where you're looking for your kid? Like, that's not going to be an easy thing. You're going to be like at the height of some anxiety and some like, what were you doing, Jesus? And you, like, I think we can identify with Mary, at least if we're parents, we can probably identify with Mary here. And Mary says, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. But then it's curious how Jesus replies, don't you think? Verse 49 to 50. And he said to them, why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? And they did not understand the saying that he spoke to them. So I think for a lot of us, again, for those of us who are parents, maybe if we have teenagers or just under teenagers, we probably look at this and we go, Well, I can't imagine what it's like for a preteen to respond by anything other than it being lippy. And that he's just like, what's wrong with you guys? But we have to remember, this is Jesus. And we're told once again and again and again, he didn't sin. So Jesus isn't being some foul-mouthed, lippy kid just telling his parents off. And so when we look at this, I think we have to realize this is actually very profound, what Jesus is telling Mary. And this is why in the moment, they didn't understand what he was saying. But but just look at how he takes what Mary said about her and his father looking for him 
And Jesus gently reminds her who his real father is. He's saying that he knows his ultimate identity rests in God the Father. It means he has responsibilities that far surpass the responsibilities of being Joseph and Mary's son. So for us as parents, I think we need to take heart of this. And we need to remember this about our kids too. It's so easy for us to forget the primary identity of our kids. It's easy for us to assume that they belong to us and us alone. We love to have a tight control in our kids. I don't know, unless you don't, and you're not like me, but I definitely know that that happens. And so then the focus can end up becoming the family itself or the family's activities or sports and school and hobbies. And we focus on all these other things to the neglect of their true identity, their main identity as those created in the image of God to worship and glorify him and to enjoy him. It's so easy to forget. Now, we might not say those things out loud. We might not tell them to their face. Don't you know you're my son? Doesn't matter what God says about you, you're mine. We would never say that. But what do our actions reveal about how we truly see our kids? What's our priority for them? That they get their schoolwork done? That they get their Bible reading done? Spending time in God's word? That they're at all the team practices and games? Or that the family's main priority focus is to gather with God's people? That we see grandma and grandpa or that we gather with gospel community? So if you were to sit down and ask your kids what they thought your family's priorities were, what your highest goals for them were, what do you think they would say? It might be a tough question to ask. Now, that's not to, to say there's anything wrong with doing a good job at school, being involved with the grandparents, enjoying your family, having hobbies. Those are all really good things, and God can be and is glorified in them. We are to do those things well for his glory. But when conflicts arise, when the schedules clash and choices have to be made, what ends up being the thing that usually gets set aside? It's not to say every once in a while, if, if you're regularly doing, setting the priority on God and his mission, that you can't do those other things every once in a while. But, but what's the priority? What's the general thing your family leans to? And is that what you want it to be? So Jesus reminds Mary that his relationship with his father comes first. And that's why he was in his father's house. That's where he needs to be. And we have to remember, Jesus does not say this to her to condemn her. He says this to her to remind her of who he is. And in response, who she is. Created in the image of God, loved by God invited into this amazing relationship where we get to experience a fullness of joy, pure joy. So that means if, if we're now able to see where our identity truly is wrapped up in, it's going to change how we do these things, how we set our priorities. But not just for the sake of priority, but for the sake of loving God. And so when you think about this whole situation, we get to see that Jesus wasn't just doing this, staying behind because he was forgetful or inconsiderate. He wasn't trying to be a bad kid. He, he was actually using this. I think his divine nature set this appointment up so that Joseph and Mary could be reminded of his true identity so that they could see his mission. And it was also to prepare them for what was yet to come. If you remember back a few weeks when we got to see Simeon talking to Mary, and he said that a sword was going to pierce through her heart also. I think this was an opportunity Jesus was giving Mary once again to have a glimpse of what that would be like. This would be a foretaste of that. Remember, there were three days Mary and Joseph had to search for Jesus. And I think those, those three days that Mary and Joseph spent looking for Jesus would pale in comparison to the three days that Mary and Jesus' disciples would be trying to figure out what the heck happened on the cross. 
And so in that moment, once again, Mary would have to face the fear of losing her son. Once again, she would have to wait three days in anguish, three days in distress, before she would be reminded of his true identity when he rose from the grave. But once again, Jesus would come with a gentle reminder of who he was. The very God who loves her and who had come to save her, rescue her, and redeem her. And then verse 51 and 52, we read this. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth, Nazareth and was submissive to them. And his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. It says Jesus returned home with them and it says he was submissive. He didn't sin against them. He didn't, by all accounts, he didn't keep bringing it up. He told them what he had to do. He reminded them of who he was. And then he simply obeyed. And we see Mary just treasures these things up in her heart. And then once again in verse 52, we see that Jesus continued to increase in wisdom and stature with God's grace upon him. So that's actually all we get to see of Jesus' youth. We don't get to see how he went through the, the awkward teenage years. I mean, that'd be a great handbook. We don't get to see it. We don't even get to see how he dealt with the loss of Joseph. That would be great to, to see too, I think. But what we do know is that the Holy Spirit decided this is all we need to know. We get to see that Jesus was obedient that he did grow, that he continued learning and growing in wisdom and stature, and he perfectly leaned into his identity in Jesus. Or sorry, <laughs> he was Jesus. He leaned into his identity of the Father. And like him, we can continue to grow and learn in the normal parts of life where we lean into our identity in Jesus. We're, we're brothers and sisters of Jesus, adopted by God, brought into the family where God is our Father. And we get to see Jesus as the Son of God who lives a normal life for the next 18 years. And we're going to pick up in chapter 3 next week, 18 years later, essentially. So for now, we get to see and be reminded once again, Jesus knows what it's like to live a normal life. Jesus knows the humdrum that you're facing. And he can identify with you, the temptations, the difficulties. He knows what it's like to be in this broken world. But again, remember, he did it without sin. And you know why he did it without sin? You know why he didn't just come to earth as a fully grown man to get on the cross and leave? So that he could live the perfect life for us in our place. It wasn't just enough for him to die in our place, but he also had to live in our place. That means when we are brought into the family of God, when we are accepted by God, in faith, when we trust in Jesus' finished work for us, we get to take all of the perfect life he lived and put it to our account. Not only do we get our death that we deserve paid for, but we get the life that we should have lived paid for. That's crazy awesome. And so now we should live as though that's true and continue to live in a way that glorifies God, that makes much of him, and that leans on that identity that we have in God. And for those of us who are parents, we can learn not just from Mary and Joseph, but from Jesus, that our kids' identities need to be first and foremost bound in the character of God and who he's made them to be. Not just that they're little image bearers of us, but they're image bearers of the creator of the universe, and they've been made to glorify God and enjoy him forever. So Father, I just pray that as a church, we would remember who we are in you, who we are in Jesus, and that your Holy Spirit dwells within us, and we dwell within you. Give us a joy in knowing you love us, you've sacrificed for us, and you've brought us into your kingdom by the work of Jesus and his work alone. Jesus, thank you that you lived an absolutely normal life for so much of it, so that when we're tempted to think that our lives are useless, that there's nothing good that's happening because we just do the same thing every day. 
Give us joy in the fact that you know what that's like and that you are still calling us to follow after you and worship you in joy. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.